So we talked a little bit about the um, um, graphic user interface stuff. Then started in on uh, DAQ, the Data Acquisition Toolbox, last time. Any questions so far? So just to reiterate a little bit, uh, we're going to build these analog in and analog out objects in MATLAB. They're going to have properties, uh, number of channels, channel names, sample rates, and so on. And each object typically has some automatic behavior that you don't program or that you set up and then it uh, then it, then the hardware works for instance you can wait on a trigger you've got timers you can have a an output trigger for D to A conversion and you have to be a little careful handling these objects because they're real they're real objects it's a it's a it's a programming construct that maps to a real physical object and so you can't just instantiate a whole bunch of these things you can only instantiate as many software objects as you have hardware objects so what I thought I'd do this time if there's no questions is to do an example of a analog input and talk about some of the things you need to do uh, the program I'm going to be talking about is simple analog in dot m and uh, I think it's linked up on your I know it's linked up in in lab one off the DAQ page <clears throat> and what I'm going to have you do for that for the first lab is to swap out the the analog setup stuff, put in new analog setup to swap from WinSound to to the uh, National Instruments adapter and modify the simple AI so that it has a GUI, has a simple GUI on it. So again, what you would normally do to start out one of these programs is to do a delete DAQ find which uh, finds all the instances of objects that you have left laying around from a crash program and delete them I like to when I define a f figure I like to define which figure I'm going to use <clears throat> if you define figure 2 it turns out the handle to that figure is now the integer 2. You could also write this fig equals figure 2 and what it will return is the number 2 which will be the handle to the window, the handle to the figure. We're going to define a variable which is the adapter name and if you go look at the at the DAC toolbox documentation you will find out that one of the supported window uh, adapter types is WinSound The first board which is installed, the first WinSound device which is installed is referred to as ID0. And I'm going to just ask for one channel. Then the very first thing to do is to create an input object, analog input object. This is now going to be the handle to the analog input. analog input is a built-in function in the DAC toolbox. <clears throat> Takes two parameters the adapter and the ID.
to do anything useful, we have to add at least one channel to the analog input. So this is now going to be a handle to the channel. So we do an add channel to the previously defined analog input with a channel number. At this point then, we've built an object which is usable. We typically want to be able to set some of the properties of the input device. One thing we're going to set here is we're going to set so set takes two parameters, a handle and a property. So we're going to set the property of the handle AI, the input device, sample rate to 44100, zero, zero, that being a standard wind sound input rate corresponding to what? Why 44,100? Anybody know why wind sound happens to use that not very round number as, yeah? It is the it is the sample rate for CD uh, recorded analog music. CDs are are specified up to about 20 kilohertz. Yeah, sure. So you avoid avoid aliasing at 20 kilohertz, uh, and CD sound, by the way, is very good compared to say MP3s. We're also going to set the number of samples per trigger that samples per trigger and no you can't abbreviate them. Actually you can abbreviate. If you give enough of this string to make it unique with uh, to make it a unique field within the structure then matlab will do string continuation i strongly recommend not doing that for readability and for your sanity <clears throat> so i'm arbitrarily going to set this to 441 because i wanted to do 1 100th one of a second and in lab one, you're going to make this a variable parameter which is controlled by a list box so that you can control the scale of the virtual oscilloscope that you're building. We're going to set the trigger repeat. to one, which means when we get a trigger, take one set of data. And we're going to set the analog input object trigger type to manual, which is to say <clears throat> we're going to trigger it with a trigger command. No matter what user interf or uh, analog interface you use, you're going to have to do some set of, of uh, description for the analog input object, which will be something like this. For the NIDAC, it is slightly different. For the National Instruments, DAQ is slightly different. The code for that is given in your lab write-up you'll substitute in here. And I did a really cheesy thing here which you're going to have to modify. I just said make the, make the oscilloscope run for 50 traces and then stop. So it runs for uh, half a second or so. Yes? So this thing gets 50 data points then? Say again? 
gets 400, 441 data points 50 times. It takes 50 triggers. 50 triggers, and each trigger is going to give you 441 samples. <clears throat> so, the very first thing you have to do is to start the AI that initializes the input object what I'm going to do here then is to immediately trigger the analog input which is to say start getting the points that's what a manual trigger means is to use this trigger command if I had said software trigger instead of manual I could set it up to respond to an external voltage. But I'm, I'm triggering it literally in the program here. Then we are going to then query the analog device, the analog input with a get data, which blocks which blocks until the trigger event is done. So we do a get data AI and we want we want to get 441 points from there so we have to tell this that we want the 441 points. There's really a couple of ways of, of, of using the syntax but the way that's sort of cleanest is to say AI dot samples per trigger as in other languages the dot notation implies that samples per trigger is a field or a pro property of the AI object And then we're going to stop AI. You don't actually have to do that in a loop. Um, the start and stop have a certain amount of overhead. You can make the system go faster if you start it once and then re-trigger it every time through. But I wasn't doing this for efficiency. You may want to do it for efficiency. Then we're just going to plot time and data MATLAB by default uh, reads it in x and y this reads x y for vectors for plot no i mean in the sequence but um, in this query you also have w right? yeah that sets the color to white oh, okay. and as I said, using a plot command in, a, in an animation, this is after all an animation, we're asking this to look like an oscilloscope, is not necessarily efficient, but it is easy. Oh yes, alright, well let's put in the white here, and the reason for that is that I decided to set the background color to something that looked oscilloscope-like, whatever that means. So. <laughs> I like to think of oscilloscopes as having kind of a green background because I'm sort of an old school analog kind of person. So GCA returns the handle from the current axis. Get current axis. So GCA is the handle of the axis that you just used since you just did a plot. Since you just did a plot that means that GCA returns the handle to the axis which has the plot. We're going to set the color then to a 3 vector 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.2 uh, so it's red, green, blue, R, G, B from 0 to 1 so 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.2 is 
kind of a dull green. I mean, the green is certainly the dominant color, but and it's only at half intensity, so it's not going to be bright green. And it has a significant contribution of red and blue, which kind of de which decreases the saturation, so it becomes kind of more grayish. So it's kind of a gray green. Yes? If you did GCA and then color, that's why is, are you intentionally trying to set the color of the axes? Does it not set the color of the axes themselves? It sets the background color. It, tur it turns out that... Is it part of the definition of what color is? Yes, it's the definition of color is the background color of the axis. You can set the axis color, the, the line color, and the text color also. I can't remember what those are called, but you can do, if you do a, a get... GCA, it'll tell you what all of the tags are, all of the properties are that you can set within it. To make the to make the to auto scale the axes, we're going to do a set GCA. I don't always like the way that MATLAB auto scales axes, but you could do a set GCA X limb, which will then force the X axis to the to the values of your choice. And we're going to do this from we're going to set this to zero on the left end to get a I samples per trigger divided by 44100 so so that the output here then will be in from 0 to the number of seconds that you sampled oh so here i used get ai samples per trigger quote and here I used AI dot samples per trigger turns out it's identical the only difference is that here samples per trigger is case sensitive and here it is not oh why did they do that just make it just make it consistent so th the only th reasonable thing to do is always assume that it's case sensitive then we're going to set GCA Y limb to minus one to one volt units or volts because wind sound has a defined input range of minus 1 to plus 1 volt where do we oh you don't define that that's hardware that you just have to know how's the program uh, it's it, it knows that since it's using wind sound that the A to D converter is calibrated properly. Okay. So the wind sound device have like safety or if it's going beyond. So if you try and cook the input by putting high voltages into it, it is impedance protected within reason. I think you can put plus minus ten in and not hurt it. I think if you hooked it to the hundred and ten line, <laughs> there'd be issues. <clears throat> Last thing we're going to do is do a grid on. Grid on is a shorthand, a MATLAB shorthand for uh, set the GC, set the grid on the current uh, axes to show, so that this this makes up. If you have the axes, they look like this. If you turn grid on, then you get the little 
lines across like this, like an oscilloscope. Like an analog oscilloscope, anyway. Yes, you can set the pitch of those. There, there's a there's a uh, uh, a, a um, property of the axes that allows you to say how many grid elements you want. I think it's label number, uh, X label number and Y label number. I think there's also one that's like set tick where you can actually put the exact values where you want the lines. Yes, you can do that too. Right. You, yeah, that's right. You can even rename the the ticks from numbers to letters and if you want to do that. We're going to give the we're going to give the axes a label time in seconds and we're going to give a y label of volts. We're going to say draw now because if you don't say draw now before you end the loop the program will take 50 sets of data exit and show you the last one. By putting draw now in there, it will animate it. Th yes? So, um, you said like y lib and x lib within the set function, but mm -hmm. x label and y label within the set function? It turns out that x label and y label are uh, <laughs> built ins that, that are a little higher level, so you don't have to use get and set. You could use get and set. So, automatically find. Right, it assumes the current axes and sets the labels on the current axes. You actually yeah. don't need a set for x limb and y limb. I, I believe that's I believe you're right. I think you just say x limb and y limb. And and um, I uh, uh, I actually tend to go more towards using get and set for everything because like most programmers, regularity is built into my brain. Can you please explain draw now again? Draw now. So you've done all these graphic operations. <coughs> graphic operations. What MATLAB does is to build a structure which defines the current figure, but it does not redraw it. It does not update the figure until one of three things happen. You exit the script, you hit a pause, or you hit a draw now. So, when you hit the draw now, MATLAB traverses the display structure and renders it to the screen. Then you always, without fail, after you, before you exit the program, you do a delete AI and maybe clear the figure or do a well, clear figure, sure, why not? So if you if you did what? If you after if you this did, point? If you did not clear the figure and you draw again. It will the way I structured this, it will it will plot erases the figure erases the axes, so it would it would still work. So I want you to hack this program and turn it into more something that looks more like an interactive oscilloscope. I was wondering, how would you plot data length in the plot function? So, <clears throat> so the way you would plot, I'm glad you asked that. My next example does that. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways of using the the DAQ interface 
this would be sort of a so-called fast data mode where you want to set up a trigger and then you want the interface to take data as fast as you possibly can. There is another mode where the program has to make a decision about the data after every data point that you take. Is it above threshold? Is it below threshold? Maybe you have some complicated you want to you want to check and see if a heartbeat has started. Just to use a random example from lab two, uh, you might want to do some sort of shape determination here on the fly, not wait for the whole waveform to be recorded. So you might want to take a point, make a decision, take another point, make a decision, and so on until you decided that a pulse has started or the next beat has started. There's, so there's a low speed way of getting data out of a out of a device that uh, allows you to do that. In this particular example, I also predefined a plot. So at at t equals zero, you define a plot. You do a plot and you return a handle to the plot and then after that you don't have to do another plot you just modify the data on the plot. So I'll show you that now since that's a fairly abstract thing to say. Okay, as usual we're going to start this out by saying figure one clear the figure clear all which clears all the variables and then do a delete DAC find for obsessiveness. Delete DAC find. And here we, then we're going to do all of the same sort of input def, but I don't want to write it out again. This is where we we add the channel, we define a, the analog input, we add a channel and so on and it's going to be the same as before so I'm not going to do it this time. But I want to parameterize the system a little better so I'm going to write a, a DT here as 0.1 second and a max T as 10 seconds and then build a time vector in the honored uh, MATLAB way of saying zero by DT to max time. What does this mean? This means build me a vector starting at zero with last entry max, max T and steps of DT. Then we're going to return a line handle from the plot function. So this is a this is a multi-line, right? It's many points. But it's a line handle to plot of time. And I just want to initialize this to the horizontal plot. All zeros. So I'm going to use the built-in function zeros one to the length of the time vector. So using this construction is a fast way of guaranteeing that I will get a vector I will get a vector out here which is of the appropriate length and has value zero. There's another way to do it which is uglier. Zero times time does the same thing. Because time is a vector, so you do a scalar multiply times any vector, you get a vector of the same length which is value zero. This is, I mean, it's very terse, but a little cheesy. This is the uh, 
this is the approved MATLAB way of doing it. Next, we're going to build a text handle by using the text built in. And we're, go oh, I better, yeah, I better, there's another command I missed here. I better insert a set GCA YLIM. minus five five because I want the text to be actually on the screen. I want the text to be at x position point five, y position four. So this is x, this is y. Start at x, y. That's the lower left hand corner of the text string. And I'm going to initialize the text string to the null string. So this is now a handle to a null string. And we're going to do a draw now, which is going to put up a window, a figure, with a line across it, a set of axes, and no text. Now, we're just going to step through this once for index equals 1 to length time. And what we're going to find is that there is a new call, get sample. equals get sample from AI gets exactly one reading. And, and unlike get data, you don't have to start, you don't have to issue a start command to the analog interface before you use get sample unless it's wind sound. And then you have to start it first. So as long as you're using the NIDAC input definition for National Instruments DAQ, as long as you're using the NIDAC interface, which is what you're going to be using for Lab 1, you don't need to do a, a start. You just do a get sample that gets exactly one value. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put this value into the current plot. Yes? No, I don't think so. Try it. So we're going to return a, a, a voltage vector now by doing a get on the line handle Y data. <clears throat> so we're going to extract back out of the plot we're going to extract the Y data back out of the plot, which starts out all zeros. We then say V index equals v sample. That then takes the current value that we're reading, modifies the V vector by at the at the specific index we're interested in. Yes. Shouldn't V equals get minus the Y data be outside the plot? Say again? Shouldn't we use that V equals get minus the of Y data? No, that's in the plot. Why is this inside the Shouldn't that line be should define this variable V, right? Why you're constantly redefining it? Because we can go through the for loop a bunch of times, right? Because every time through, it's going to be different. 
because I'm going to have, after the first time through, I'm going to have written the first value, after the second time through the th second value, the third time through the third value. So what you're going to see is this waveform slowly draw itself across the screen. I haven't yet done that, yes. The very next thing I'm going to do then is to do a set line handle y data back to v. And obviously I could have combined these, but I'm separating them out for hopefully for clarity. <clears throat> By doing this operation, I have changed the plot without doing a replot much faster. Furthermore, now we're going to modify the string. So we're, so we're going to set the text handle and the property we're going to set is the string property of the text handle, which is the string that's displayed on the screen. num to string. So we're going to convert to a string the current time. Index times dt minus dt, because I like it to start at zero better. <clears throat> at this point, nothing has yet been drawn on the screen until we do the draw now. And at that point, the new string will be rendered, the new plot will be rendered, and the effect is we will see this creeping line of points go across the screen. Uh, and how many, let's see, 10 seconds at point one's 100 points at uh, 10 per second should take 10 seconds to get across the screen. Yeah. Do we have the device start like we did? No start AI somewhere? Don't need a start AI for get sample using NIDAC. Okay. <clears throat> the get sample says I'm going to start just long enough to get one sample and stop it again. Okay, so that's it's built in. Okay. Now we're going to do sort of a, a cheesy thing we're going to pause for dt and then end the loop and then of course delete ai this is a this is a cheesy way of making the system real time i'm asking the 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 a to d converter to get one sample every tenth of a second by putting a pause by dt in the loop i'm slowing down the display to 10 per second. Now it's not exactly 10 per second because this other processing takes some time. Right? How would you make it more accurate? Start a counter. And which counter would you start? Tick and talk, right. So here you could say tick and here you could say dt minus talk. Tick and talk are built in, built ins. Tick starts a timer. Talk reads it. Somebody with a bizarre sense of humor used those keywords. Made those keywords. Go on. Ah. So, if talk were greater than dt, then you ought to. You ought to, You. That's a very good point. You probably ought to say the min of 0 and dt minus talk. No, max. The max of 0 and dt minus talk. And that would be safe.
So we've moved all of this heavy stuff, mainly the plot command, outside. We get a very fast data uh, substitution command in here, followed by a fairly fast traversal of the, of the plot structure, and so we get good animation rate. You make quite fast stuff this way. You can easily make a, say, six panel oscilloscope with all of the traces being updated at once. I saw a guy, one of, one of my students one year, uh, solved a problem that's been bothering humanity for generations. He put accelerometers into a Frisbee with a wireless unit, a gyro and a, an accelerometer, so when he threw it, he could map the six-axis acceleration and rotation rate on, on, the, on his uh, laptop in MATLAB. <clears throat> and it was completely real-time. So any questions about this? At one point, a few years ago, a few years ago, 1998, I, uh, I was starting up a, 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 I was doing instrumentation for a lab in biology. They wanted to convert completely to MATLAB for data acquisition. So they wanted a virtual oscilloscope that was tuned for neurobiology. So I wrote a, a virtual oscilloscope using th this interface. And it worked. I got it completely running on my desk machine. This was in Windows 98. Windows 98. And then the lab machines were in wind, running Windows NT because we wanted some kind of security on them. And when I took it over to Windows NT, it blue screened it. And when you blue screen, I mean, it blue screened it. There's nothing. You, it crashed. It crashed the kernel. So uh, the only thing to do, the only way to debug that, is start commenting out code until it doesn't blue screen anymore, and then do success. And every time you do that, of course, it takes two minutes to reboot. So as it transpired, the bug was that I had, uh, when, I, when I clicked one particular button, it checked something and then deleted an object, an input object, while a timer was running in the background. The timer then looked for that object to update the display. And I was only using this for debugging, but the timer then looked for the object which was deleted, had a pointer to nowhere, probably to null. Boom! Turns out the memory protection wasn't very good in Windows NT. But why did it play on Windows NT than on your PC? I think because Windows 98 was too stupid to notice, but I don't know for sure. Or, or, or it may be that the function wasn't working right in the first place. But when I got rid of the debugging code, it all worked. And uh, <clears throat> because you're defining objects which are persistent and have a state, and because you can delete them, you can make the program self-inconsistent in a, in a way that you can't normally do in MATLAB. It's more like handling C. Yeah, you can have pointers to nowhere which really don't work well. Any, any questions about lab one at this point? Seems straightforward. So the, the write-up on this is going to be minimal, uh, but there is a little bit to do. 
I'm going to ask you to do some output also. Oh, I, I should say a little bit more about triggering, I guess. Probably in lab two, where I'm asking you to do a pulse plethysmograph, you're probably going to want to use a slow acquisition mode because you don't need more than 30 or 40 samples a second to define a heartbeat. And you don't need more than a few samples a minute to get breath rate. So you're probably going to go, want to go for a slow acquisition mode in, uh, in lab two. But later on, we may need some, some more sophisticated triggering. So let me just, let me just uh, write up a little bit about the triggering modes. There's a trigger type uh, property. And I think I said this last time, that we can have this be immediate. manual or software. If you're in immediate mode, that means when you start the object, it triggers. So then start and trigger become synonymous. In manual mode, you use the trigger command. In software mode, <coughs> which I think should be called hardware mode, you can then specify a trigger condition and the trigger condition can be one of rising falling leaving or entering and if it's leaving or entering, you would give it a two vector, V1, V2, which correspond to some boundaries. But but to specify this, you have to then have a trigger condition value because no property is too long a string. So you specify you specify the vector or a voltage. For, for, for rising, you specify one voltage. For falling, you specify one voltage. For entering and leaving, you specify a vector of two voltages. This means it crossed this value of V with a positive slope. Falling means it crosses this value of V with a negative slope. So you can do some pretty nice, some pretty nice trading. Yeah. Leaving. So leaving means, let's say we have some voltage range here. Voltage is sitting up in here and suddenly goes like this. It leaves this range and causes a trigger. Thank you. Again, any questions? Okay. So, should we start talking about lab two or should we talk about, what do you want to talk about? More questions on lab one? Let's start talking about lab two. Don't talk about anything at all. I saw that. <laughs> yes? Hold spacing? Oh, for the output. Well, 
One way to do it, which is phenomenally memory intensive, but after all you got eight gigabytes, is just generate a vector that contains the two pulses. You've got some sample rate. You know, this might be a megabyte long. Who cares? <clears throat> That's probably the most general way. Anything else? Okay, let's talk about lab two a little bit. So, your body is remarkably uh, transparent to infrared, as some of you already know. Um, uh, and an example of that, <clears throat> I can't do this anymore because I'm now carrying a yellow flashlight rather than a red flashlight. But you could take a, a, a red LED, stick it up your nose, and blink it like that, and you can see it in your eyeball. Right. Better to do this with an LED than a, than a laser. And 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 better not to share LEDs. All right, you should you should you know maintain some sort of sterility because after all, flu is going around. Not to mention norovirus. So, uh, um, but of course, the interesting thing is you shine up your nose and blink, and you can see it through maybe that much stuff, right? Tissue, and of course, you see it on the outside edge of your eye, not the inside edge because all the images going through your lens are inverted but this information is going through the sclera of your eye it's going through the connective tissue and not through the lens and so it is not mapped correctly it's not inverted like most like every other image would be so you see it peripherally out on the edge of your eyeball you should do this it's fun it's easier in a dark room than in a light room like this you need a fairly bright LED in a room like this um, What's more amazing is that the infrared which passes through tissue carries information about blood flow. Red blood cells absorb red light rather well. They absorb infrared rather well. And in fact, uh, they absorb light differentially with frequency depending on whether the hemoglobin is oxygenated or deoxygenated. And I don't remember the absorption peaks. Do you remember, Corinne? Yeah, the wavelength. Uh, 660 and 940. 660 and 940. So 660 is in the red, and 940 is in the far infrared. But <clears throat> you can, by taking the ratio of absorbances of those two frequencies, you can determine the oxygenation state of the blood, as well as by reflectance, you can tell how much blood is there. Because the reflectance or absorb absorbency of your tissue changes with with blood flow because the red blood cells are so absorptive you could put a an LED on one side of your finger and a photodiode or a phototransistor on the other side and by measuring the amount of infrared that goes through your finger you can uh, you can detect pulse rate because the amount of blood changes in your finger depending upon the blood pressure doesn't change very much but all it has to do is change one part in 10,000 and you can pick it up with the right amplifier. Now, a lot of you have done this in some lab or some course or another. Have all of you done it? TA hasn't done it, okay. Uh, have done, okay, so there's still some interest here. <clears throat> and it, it's still a good experiment even if you, even if you do it because there's lots of vari variances on this. For instance, it also works if you bounce light off and back out. It works through your skull. In fact, there was a, a, a 4760 project done last year by two people in the class who showed they could uh, record from the, they could re record blood flow in the motor cortex by shining infrared light through the skull and, ba and then recording the, what's scattered back out. There's a lot of stuff between there. There's, you know, there's a half a centimeter of bone there. It works much better in infants where they have almost transparent skulls. 
one way of getting very non-invasively getting brain activity in infants is to slap a, a little helmet on them with a bunch of infrared emitters and detectors. You can get a really quick read on blood oxygen in the brain without having to put electrodes on them or, or do anything invasive. Well, well there's, I mean, there certainly is going to be mapping to many parts of the brain, but if you're planning motion, you would think that there'd be motor cortex activity. So it's not necessarily unique in the brain, but it certainly cause and effect. So at any place where a vein is surfacing, you can measure? Well, it turns out, it turns out you don't even need a vein because there's capillaries going through every part of your body, and your, your fingers actually change volume with your pulse. Your, 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 your fingers swell and shrink with pulse because you're changing pressure. So there's, 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 there's blood everywhere. Um, one problem, however, I've seen in the lab where it's like 50 degrees in the winter's time sometimes, is that if your hands are cold, it doesn't work. Because you vasoconstrict to maintain heat in your body, you vasoconstrict your fingers, and you have so little blood flow you can't get a signal. I've seen this happen lots of times with people that have cold hands. And the way you fix it is, have your partner do it, or run to the bathroom, run your hands under hot water for a minute or two, warm them all up, wrap them in a towel, run back in, and do it before your hands cool off and then it works. So what happens in the hospital when you can't get a pulse ox off of somebody's finger? You go to a different finger. You try until you get it. But it's a problem. But what if we shine a brighter LED? If there's no blood flow, <clears throat> then yes, if you, if, you, if you can find the signal at all, yes, you probably could do it. Uh, if you, if, but if the signal is gone, if, if you're at, the system we are going to be using has a signal to noise ratio of 10 to 1 or 50 to 1. So if you've, if you've dropped your blood flow by a factor of 10, uh, then it gets hard. And he, my, my wife has this weird syndrome where when her hands get cold, one finger turns blue. Raynaud's, right. And I, I, we don't know I, it, what causes that in her. She doesn't smoke. Smokers often have this happen. She doesn't smoke. She's never smoked. But one finger or sometimes a finger on each hand will turn bright blue. The rest of her hand is warm, and that one finger is stone cold because there's no blood flow in it. It's odd. Do you have that happen? Yes, I know. Sometimes, like my fingers will get white, and you just have to warm them up, and it's fine. It's not; they can't hurt you with them. They do. Anything. It doesn't do anything to you. There's no muscle down there, right? All the muscles for these fingers are up here. So all that's down there is is uh, is bone and connective tissue and some skin and a little bit of fat. And uh, so you, your fingers can get quite cold, and you can be very, very uncomfortable, but it won't hurt you. It's like chicken feet, right? Chicken feet can get pretty cold, and it doesn't hurt chicken, as it turns out. <coughs> I worry about this. I have chickens, right? <coughs> Naturally. Naturally. <laughs> so so the, the drill here is going to be to put a high-gain amplifier on your finger, across the, across the sensor on your finger, and to jack the signal up, the differential signal, the changing signal, bump this is different, the differential signal up to by about a factor of 10,000 or so, which will make it recordable through the NIDAC unit. And then I'm going to ask you to take the resulting waveform and analyze it. So most of you will probably see a waveform that looks like this. By the way, if any of you have a problem or in, for any reason at all do not want your physiological data shared in the lab, you are perfectly free not to put your finger in this. You can use my finger or your partner's finger, but nobody 
has to feel compelled to share physiological data if you don't feel like it. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why you might want to do that. It's up to you. You're going to get a waveform like this. I'm going to ask you to derive the pulse rate from it. Oh, that's interesting. This is called the dichrotic notch. Dichrotic notch. And it is a, a reflection wave caused by the big valves at the bottom of your heart slamming shut. Does the amount of hemoglobin affect the amount of oxygen blood carries and in effect? Yes, yes, absolutely. So you could measure the hemoglobin of a patient? Yes, at least relatively. If you can figure out some way to normalize it, I think maybe by doing multi band, multi, uh, multi color, you could get the amount of hemoglobin. And that would be an interesting. Do you know if you can do that? I don't know if you can do that. You could certainly get the oxygenation. You could probably get the amount by the, by the abs. <clears throat> Yes, or a normal baseline, you might be able to get it by the percentage of reflectance change. I don't know. That's an interesting question. It'd be interesting to try and do a little research on that and find out. It'd be a good final project. Dichrotic notch is stronger in some people than others. It's usually stronger in younger people than older people because your arteries are more elastic. So this pumps up the this pumps up your arteries. They get bigger around the uh, main valve in your heart goes shut, pressure starts to drop, arteries collapse again and a reflection wave bounces off the heart and, and causes a pressure jump. <clears throat> this can cause some hassle if you're getting heart rate. Um, you're going to have to somehow detect periodicity here. How are you going to do that? between peaks so so you could say I want the highest point on the waveform every time turns out that's noisy because because by definition peaks have no have have zero slope right and any noise on the peak then can move the position of the peak back and forth quite a lot so going peak to peak works, but may not be optimal. So you could do dichrotic notch. You could do first derivative. Look for the change in sign in the first derivative. You could threshold it. Ah, but you surely wouldn't want to threshold it right there, where you get what apparently looks like two beats, right? So that means that unless you want to be adjusting this all the time, you need to have an automatic threshold adjustment. Think about how to do that. If you did a thresholding, then you get a square wave out. That still doesn't give you the heart rate. Now you have to decide what the heart rate is. Of course, you can always get the instantaneous heart rate by going like this. What you're going to find, though, <clears throat> is if your finger moves. You've got a little bit of tremor, too much coffee for, too much of that good Matin's coffee for breakfast. You're going to find that the waveform actually looks like, like that. And there's a, there is a heart signal in there. But it's kind of shaky because your hand is quivering in the, in the sensor, which causes a motion artifact. And it's a periodic signal, maybe. But how are you going to distinguish a periodic signal, which is noise, noisy, from the periodic signal of the heartbeat? And that's one of the things I'm going to ask you to do, is figure out a way of determining valid data valid heartbeat from invalid heartbeat. Well, that certainly helps. And what they certainly do in hospitals is you have a little, looks like a clothespin you clip on your finger, and you could do that. 
Uh, you can also use a piece of foam and stick two of the sensors through the foam and then slide it over your finger. You can tape them to your forehead. You don't have to use your finger. You can tape it to your forehead, something that doesn't move very much. At least you've been Botoxed. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's this weird having your forehead Botoxed, you know, it, it, it paralyzes the muscles that make you frown, right? It makes you happier. It makes you feel happier if you can't frown. Even if you don't look at yourself. What the hell does that mean? But, but how about clipping it to the ear? Ear won't shake or move? Clipping, clipping the ear is actually very good. The problem is many people's earlobes is rather cold. My earlobe's pretty warm today, but it's... You get a warm earlobe? I had a, had a person try to do that. They wanted to have... <clears throat> two or three years ago, there was a group in, in 4760 that did a heart sensing shirt. So they had, they sewed a hundred or 150 white LEDs into a t-shirt so that so that they could trigger them in waves from a heartbeat. So they had this thing going on the chest at the heart rate and they wanted to have it wired to an earring. So you'd wire, you have the earring with a wireless unit in it that would transmit to the shirt, which would then display your pulse for the world to see. And they got the, the it, it turns out wiring the shirt and making it wearable was a big job. Uh, also, it, it has a tendency to not feel very good because of all the wires on the inside. So they had, they had a lot of trouble building the shirt, but they got it built. And they never got the sensor working on the earlobe, but they, had, they were using a finger sensor, a portable a foam sensor over the finger. So it would be interesting to see if you could <coughs> use a, uh, you know, a wireless pendant on, on the ear. That'd be kind of weirdly stylish in a geekly kind of way, you know. <laughs> or maybe it just blinks a little LED on your ear in time with uh, your heartbeat. Maybe it doesn't have to be wireless even. It does a little readout in your ear. Anyways. Uh, You need some way of, of determining the periodicity, the percentage of periodicity of the waveform. How, is it 90% is it predictable? 98% predictable? Is it white noise? Because one of the things I'm going to ask you to do for this lab is to come up with an estimate of when the data is valid versus not valid. When do you have a valid heart rate? Do it any way you want. I've seen it done three or four different ways. I'm going to ask you to build a breathing sensor. I bought four meters of conductive rubber gasket material. It is about a half millimeter in diameter. You stretch it, its resistance goes up because it's carbon particles in a, in a, in a, bind, in a substrate. They get, the particles get further apart, the resistance goes up. Don't put a meter of this stuff around your chest. Cut up six inches off of it or so. You'll get a bigger change this way, right? You'll get a bigger change it is more sensitive if you have a shorter piece maybe six inches take a piece of connect of, of wire hook it around your chest hook it to the ends of the of this uh, rubber and then put a couple of clip leads on it you should be able to make a breath sensor um, although it turns out that this waveform contains the informa information for breathing also but it's much worse signal to noise ratio it would be cool to see if somebody could get the breathing rate out of this. If you, if you emphasize your breathing by restricting the orifice a little bit so you go it, it, it changes your intrathoracic pressure more dramatically and the signal gets bigger. Wow, I just hyperventilated enough to make myself dizzy. <laughs> Cheap high. So, 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 uh, uh, 
you can extend this in various ways. You can, you can see if you can get the low signal to noise ratio for the breathing uh, and correlate it with the, with the signal off your chest, which should be very good. Or I think you can actually get breathing from your abdomen also. Some people breathe by expanding their chest muscles. Other people breathe by moving their abdomen in and out, which moves their diaphragm up and down. Right? It's actually recommended that you breathe more from the abdomen than from using your thoracic muscles, I believe. But most people do both. So you don't necessarily, you could probably wrap it around your waist and still get your breathing. Any questions about that? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice experiment. It's a good warm-up experiment because it's got some sensors, it's got some op-amps, you have to worry a little bit about noise. Um, there's a signal detection aspect to it. It uses the NIDAC stuff well. It's a, it's a good warm-up. Okay, I'll see you. Uh, how many of you are going to be in lab this afternoon? I'll see you in a few minutes. And the rest of you will be there tomorrow. Yippee! When Akshay is going to be there. Because the, way I'm, the reason I'm saying yippee is I'm running two labs in the same space at the same time. So 5760 and 5030 are in the space at the same time. Today and tomorrow. And so, but both TAs, TAs for each course can only come on Friday. See you in a little while.